thank you so much for coming. Just letting you know that the session is recorded. And so as we begin, we'd like you to stay on mute and then we'll have time throughout the discussion where we're gonna invite you to participate. And then throughout, you're welcome to put questions and comments in the chat. I'm Chris Egan, the Associate Dean of the Fulton School of Liberal Arts, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. The way our session will work is we'll have one of our presenters talk a bit about her research and her recent book. We'll have a little bit of transition time where you can ask a question or make a comment, and then we'll do the same with our other presenter talking about her work and her book. And then we'll have some more open, flexible discussion time at the end where we can draw some conclusions and synthesize all the great stuff that we've heard. And so I'd love to begin by introducing our Dean of the Fulton School of Liberal Arts, Martin Paraboom, to talk a bit about this first in a series of two where we have faculty book authors sharing their work with us. So again, thank you everyone. Yes, thanks for joining us. Good to be here this afternoon. I'll be super quick because I think we want to dig into uh, the books themselves, but uh, I would just want to recognize what an accomplishment it is for our faculty to uh, to write books. Uh, they're, they are uh, a big project and, uh, and even when you think you're done, you're not because you have to do the index, <laughs> which uh, it's always kind of fun to having written a couple of books uh, and done the index, which is sort of the anticlimax to writing your book, um, where you're uh, having to sort of go through the text and sort of point. It's it's actually kind of fun, but you didn't realize that there was like a two week task ahead of you still at the end when you think you're done, just when you think you're done your book. Um, but it is but it is a big accomplishment, especially at um, uh, the kind of institution that we are, which is a public regional comprehensive university proudly so, um, but we don't place the same premium on faculty research that a research one institution, according to the Carnegie classification system, uh, would. Um, and that means that um, these big research projects are just that much harder to fit into our very busy uh, work lives. So it is that much more of an accomplishment to, to, uh, to pull off these achievements. And in saying all of that, I don't mean in any way, shape or form to diminish uh, those for whom creative activity is really measured in terms of scholarly articles that go into peer review journals, or for our artists who, uh, who produce uh, works of art, whether it's in the performing arts or the visual arts, uh, that is there, that is their activity, their professional activity. All of that is, is really critical to what we do as an academic institution. Um, but uh, we still wanna celebrate when, when people are, uh, are, are um, done with those those big book projects and um so in fairly recent memory this was before the pandemic i think maybe i'm just trying to think we've done one more recently but celine carry on in history um did a book on um what's it called El eloquence uh, eloquence and Eloquence Embodied, which just won another prize. And I'm pleased to note actually that Dr. Carrion just won the um, uh, University System of Maryland Board of Regents Award for Scholarship, which is uh, just awesome for, for all of us at Salisbury University because it is a recognition that really, really distinctive scholarship can come from a public regional comprehensive university. Um, and be recognized by a body that also, in theory, could be recognizing um, scholars whose work would get Nobel Prizes, right? You think about College Park and these massive uh, departments in, in, in sciences and other areas where uh, they're, they're doing research on that level. So to be recognized for that, I think, is really great for all of us at Salisbury University. But, uh, but today, we celebrate the accomplishments, in particular, of two of our colleagues in um, the Department of Communication. Uh, and I think it's it's gonna be kind of cool to think about and talk about how their works are really very different and uh, illuminate the diversity of, of pursuits within the field of and department and program of communication. And some of you students probably would, and that would resonate with students and faculty uh, here on the call. So uh, congratulations. Uh, to Drs. Agarwal and Cox for this uh, great accomplishment and look forward to hearing you talk a little bit about your books and us engaging in some conversation around it. 
Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Jennifer Brannick Cox. She's an associate professor in the communication department at Salisbury University. She received her doctorate from the University of Florida in mass communication. Her specialties include multimedia journalism, newsroom culture, and social media. Her teaching and research areas also include community, solutions and participatory journalism, and civic engagement. Her textbook incorporating engaged journalism practices and multimedia reporting techniques titled Feature Writing and Reporting Journalism for the Digital Age was published in August 2020. This book offers a fresh look at feature writing and reporting in the 21st century. The award-winning author illustrates the fundamentals of feature writing and reporting while emphasizing the skills and tools needed to be successful in the digital era. Special attention to new multimedia and online reporting prepares readers for success in a rapidly changing media landscape. Thank you so much, Dr. Cox. Still muted, all right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Egan, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you guys so much for coming. I see so many uh, familiar faces, colleagues, students, and mom. Uh, so thank you uh, all for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about my book, um, and I'm going to kind of go through it chapter by chapter. Uh, I promise not to take longer than the allotted uh, time, but I do want to just kind of go over why the book was, why I felt thought the book was necessary and, and uh, a little bit about each chapter and how it got put together. So thank you guys for being here. Uh, I certainly appreciate it. Um, so to start with, I want to talk a little bit about the need for this book. So typically, the, a lot of you guys are multimedia journalism majors uh, that are here with us today. So thank you uh, so much for being here. And a, a, a lot of you I see from my intro class, my Journalism 1 uh, Com 240 class. And so in that class, you guys know that basically a journalism and a public relations curriculum, they all begin with the basics of news reporting, uh, wherein we learn this style called inverted pyramid. So you guys hopefully all know inverted pyramid. I'm seeing some smiles and nods. That's good. Um, so inverted pyramid style of writing in journalism means that we start with the most important information at the top of the story, and then we filter down to the least important uh, parts, and we stop writing when we're done. When we run out of facts, we're done writing. Um, and so our basic inverted pyramid style structure begins with a who, what, when, where, and sometimes why of the story in what's called a hard news lead. Um, and so uh, it's, it's your basic story for people who, uh, you know, read on social media, who read quick hits, breaking news, that kind of thing. Uh, and it's for people that we assume maybe not make it to the, to the bottom of the story, to the end of the story. It's basically just to get you the information quickly and concisely as best as possible. And those are the kind of things that we teach in the Journalism One class. Um, and you can see here some examples of the books that are used in those classes. Uh, writing and Reporting News is what I use there by Carol Rich. Dynamics of news writing and uh, news writing and reporting. These are your pretty basic texts for journalism one. Now fast forward a bit to the next level, intermediate and advanced reporting. This is where we get into a style that's a little bit more um, uh, rich with context and content, um, where we have to dive in and think about reporting strategies and telling the story in ways that really appeal to people uh, in different ways. So we have to kind of recognize our readers where they're at. And so when you get to that level, for me, it was a class that I created called called um, Advanced uh, Feature Storytelling, um, but there's lots of different names for it across different journalism curricula. Uh, and basically it's either intermediate or advanced journalism or feature reporting or something along those lines. Every school uh, that teaches journalism has a version of this class, wherein we go beyond the basics of that hard news inverted pyramid style, and we focus more on the why and the how in the story. And you guys who are news consumers are probably very familiar with these types of stories. They're the ones that you actually read in depth. They're not the headlines that you scan, they're the ones that you actually immerse yourself in. And so these come in the form, in several different forms. First, uh, in an in-depth investigative coverage, uh, and then also in soft news coverage that's kind of creative or interesting. So covering an event or a profile or something along those times. Sports, a lot of sports stories fall into this area. So things that are maybe more fun, less essential, but still interesting uh, and for our readers to, to follow. 
Um, and a lot of feature reporting also includes what we call proactive reporting. So there's two types of reporting, proactive and reactive, right? So the inverted pyramid style that we talked about first, the basic style is reactive. A news event happens, there's a crash, uh, somebody gives a speech, something like that, we react as reporters. But it's proactive reporting that really is where the good, really meaty stories come from. The ones that we observe as a journalist, a trend uh, or an issue going on in society, and we go out and we report it and try to get to the bottom of it. Um, and so that's what really good in-depth features can do. Uh, and there's a couple different types. So enterprise and evergreen stories. Enterprise are those that uh, journalists notice as trends or issues or things like that. Evergreen stories got their name because evergreen trees, as you guys know, are green year round. Uh, and so these are stories that could run anytime. They're not specifically related to any kind of a time peg. They're just stories that people might like to read anytime, anywhere. Um, so that's a type of feature reporting. There's also more in-depth news features. So things that kind of have a hard news topic. So it might be something like crime or, or um, uh, education or environment or something along those lines, but we dig in deeper beyond just the hard breaking news. Uh, and then there's also, like I said, trends and issues. Now, these are the three books uh, that are kind of out, that were kind of out there circulating uh, at the time where I started teaching this class, Advanced Feature Storytelling. And I tried, I've tried actually all three of them, plus some others, several others that are uh, occupying my bookshelves. And I just could never really find the right fit for these classes. My main problem with them, was that they focused too much on writing and literary writing. So kind of really long magazine style writing. And they didn't focus at all on reporting, which is a really, really important part of the process, right? You're not gonna have anything to write if you can't come up with re creative reporting strategies. And so these books I felt and my publisher Sage uh, agreed, uh, just weren't good enough, weren't really meeting the needs uh, for journalism teachers at the intermediate and advanced level. So with that in mind, I pitched this book, uh, Feature Writing and Reporting, Journalism in the Digital Age, because another problem with these books is that they are woefully outdated. They really only talk about kind of the basic standards of feature writing, trying to find formulas for a form of writing that is anything but formulaic. Uh, and it doesn't really talk about how to incorporate things like social media, um, digital trends, audience-centric reporting uh, into the equation. So. My publisher was really excited about the opportunity and worked with me uh, over the over two and a half years uh, to create this book, uh, which thankfully I got to use for the first time in my own class in the fall. Um, so uh, again, I'm gonna take you kind of through the chapters and uh, tell you a little bit about what they're about and how uh, they are relevant to the field. So the first chapter is just a basic overview of feature storytelling in the digital age. So um, before I get into to that, I want to tell you a little bit about the digital age. You hear this term, but what does it actually mean? Well, a digital age is just like any other in history. Um, you know, there's the Bronze Age, the Stone Age, there's the Industrial Age, and, and various ages like that. So um, scholars actually mark the digital age as the economic shift away from industry and manufactured goods to prize information. You notice that in the US, we don't make very many things anymore, and yet we're leaders of industry. And the reason for that is this shift to what's called the digital age. We have information, we have knowledge and know-how, and that's what puts us uh, still at the top of development, even though we physically make very little in this country. Um, so it taught, it, the digital age is concerned with shifts in information delivery, receipts, so devices, the internet, online platforms, basically the way we get and give information. So this is obviously very relevant to journalists, right? Because journalists' whole job is to basically be liaisons of information. We take information from our sources and then we deliver it to our readers, viewers, listeners, depending on your platform. Uh, and so to do that, obviously a, a disruption, a major disruption like the internet in the communication style needs to bring about changes to the way that we do news. Um, so the digital age definitely affects the way that we deliver news to people. Um, now people don't consume news by, you know, with this physical newspaper anymore, uh, right? So um, in fact, I was talking with the editor of the flyer um, just today, and this is the first time I've picked up a physical copy of the flyer and I went, wait, when did they change the masthead and everything? So we were, we were talking about that um, because people don't get their news there anymore. They get it, you know, right here on their phone. 
Um, we, it, our expectations of what we expect from the news and reporters as audience members has changed significantly. Right now, uh, you know, it used to be that we could wait until tomorrow's newspaper or even the six o'clock, seven o'clock, 11 o'clock newscast uh, to get information. But now we have no patience for that. We are an instant on demand society. And so if something happens, we wanna know it, we expect to know it immediately. Uh, and so that drives expectations of reporters. I remember being a full-time reporter and getting to go home at the end of the day and thinking that my day was largely done. That is not the case anymore. Uh, there were of course still instances, even back in you know, the dark ages of just newspapers, not that long ago when you know, we would still get a call in the middle of the night and have to cover a big story. But now that happens with regularity. We go home and our job doesn't end there. Um, we're still checking social media. We're still distributing information uh, via social media and online platforms. And it's, it's basically a 24 hour job, which is why there is such intense burnout uh, of, among organizations that don't um, basically help their reporters or give them the tools that they need to survive. That's a whole nother talk that we could have, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna shift away from that. And then of course, how people get and share news. We know now that people don't necessarily you know, go to Washington Post or Baltimore Sun or dailytimes.com. They don't necessarily go to those websites seeking news. Where they get it is on social media platforms. So what is it that's gonna make people share news? What is the news quality of this story that's gonna cause other people to, to share it with their friends and followers uh, and to um, actually click and read the story? And there's a lot of metrics and data now that tell us what kind of stories these are. So our shifting, uh, we, we as journalists have to shift our priorities. This is a really, really big change for us. Uh, and it's something that's been very slow coming, too slow, in fact, uh, which is why so much of the industry is in turmoil because we really were resisting the change for too, too long. So uh, we have to acknowledge first and foremost that we're not the best at breaking news anymore. Right? We, who is it that's better at breaking news? You are, right? Anybody who's in the right place at the right time with this in their hand is gonna be better at breaking news than I am as a trained reporter. And so we have to accept that. So it's like, okay, well, what's the point? Why even have us anymore, right? Uh, well, you need us to add context to that story, to add authenticity. And more importantly, and why we need feature reporting is to really dive into the why and how. Anybody with a phone can do who, what, when, where, but it takes a journalist to really dive in deep and do the how and the why. And that's why we need to have this kind of training to really think about reporting strategies that are creative, that can help us to tell stories in audience centric ways. Uh, we aren't the only gatekeepers of information. It used to be when you read this newspaper that you read from A1 to A2 to B1 to C, et cetera, et cetera, in a linear fashion. Uh, we told you what to read by giving you the only source that you had. And now that's not the case. Now, a lot of times we suffer as audiences, as consumers from confirmation bias, where we'll go out and seek news that confirms what we already believe to be true, um, which leads to, has led to largely the polarization of our country. Again, different talk for a different day. But acknowledging the fact that we as journalists are no longer the ones starting the conversation or pointing people in the right direction, uh, is it's a challenge for us and something that we've had to accept. Also the fact that we have to acknowledge that objectivity, the, the idea of objectivity is almost impossible, right? Uh, we used to teach not that long ago that, that uh, reporters should uh, approach a story as if they have no opinion about it whatsoever. Well, I mean, I, I can't imagine going to a story and like I'd have to physically remove my brain from my head to not have some opinion about the story, right? So instead of objectivity, which is clearly impossible, with a social media account, we're telling people who we are and where we came from, uh, and, and we can't hide that, and we shouldn't hide that, we have to brand ourselves. Um, instead of that idea of objectivity, we need to lean more on impartiality. So yes, we have opinions, yes, they affect the way that we do our work, but we're gonna keep those opinions and biases out of our stories in order to tell a story uh, that is helpful to you. It's not our job to tell you what to think, it's our job to tell you what to think about. So obviously the type of journalism that based, that the digital age has spawned is a good, it's a better type of journalism. Uh, when I was working in the newsroom uh, for the first few years of my career, 
people could write in with emails or letters to the editor all they wanted to. And I didn't read them, didn't care, right? What you as an audience member had to say to me, not important, doesn't affect my work. I'm doing my job, whatever. You can blow off your steam with a letter all you want to. Now that's impossible, right? We cannot ignore our audiences. They have a platform, they have a megaphone, and they are not afraid to use it. And you know what? I'm not afraid to say that the way I was doing it in my early 20s was wrong. It was wrong. I should have been listening to my community. I should have been leaning on them to help me generate story ideas, to find better sources, more diverse sources, and to tell stories better. But I didn't. And so that's been a hard shift in the newsroom to kind of shift from this ivory tower position where we know what's best for you community to actually listening to what our communities need. And we'll talk about that more later. So chapters two through five uh, kind of go through the basics. So a lot of those books that I showed you at the beginning, it covers some of those concepts. So things like the basics of feature storytelling, uh, you know, different styles, different structures that you can use, different types of leads, different types of, of writing strategies, all of that's in there uh, for, because we don't want to throw away, you know, the baby with the bathwater. There is some uh, foundational things about feature writing and journalism that are still relevant today. They matter and they will always matter. Um, but what my book adds to it is kind of goes beyond those, shows lots of examples and goes beyond those to also incorporate ways that we can tell audience centric stories using social media and different digital age perspectives to tell the story better. Um, my interviewing chapter focuses on finding diverse sources. We used to do what's called man on the street coverage. I've now amended my classes to person on the street coverage, which is more appropriate anyway. Um, but we called it man on the street coverage because something would come up. I, I remember one time we had a, an earthquake uh, in South Florida, which is very weird. Uh, and so I literally went, got in the car and drove to the beach, which was near our office and just asked a bunch of people, did you feel it? Did you feel it? What, what do you think? And it took me hours to find people that had felt it and who wanted to talk about it. Now, all I need to do is get on Twitter and just look for all the people talking about it. And I can DM them, I can message them, much, much better sources, right? My sources don't have to be in the right place at the right time. Now they can just reach out to me themselves and they do. It also helps us with finding underserved people. A lot of times what we do uh, in journalism because we have deadlines that we have to adhere to is we would just keep going to the same people over and over and over again for every story for the sake of efficiency. But now we have a whole world of sources online that are easy to connect with. And that's opened up so many doors to creating much, much better reporting, much more diverse use of sources. And then of course the ethics chapter actually, you know, takes ethical issues that we, which all of my students know, I'm such an ethics nerd. I love talking about ethics. I'm dying to do an entire class just on ethics um, because there are very few right or wrong answers. There's a whole lot of gray. Um, but this book uh, examines some of those issues raised by social media uh, and things that come up, particularly in feature reporting. With feature reporting, you have the opportunity and expectation to get closer to your sources, to spend a lot more time with your sources, and that can raise some ethical issues as far as covering them fairly and their expectations of you as a reporter. When you become ingrained in someone's life, um, they start, start to make expectations of you, and if your coverage doesn't go the way they thought it should, that can create a lot of problems. All right, so the next three chapters are the ones that I'm most excited about because this was an opportunity for, real, for me to take some of the techniques that I was using in my classes and really showcase them in a way that no other book had done. So the first one was a, a class that I created here as a special topic that I absolutely love teaching. Uh, I actually take my students, when we do immersion journalism, I take them um, roller, doing roller skating karaoke. We've done that. Uh, we've gone kayaking. Uh, we've done Habitat for Humanity builds. We've gone out with From Roots to Wings and Fed the Homeless, all in the name of journalism. And it's such a fun class, and it is by far my favorite journalism strategy. Um, I actually do it myself as a freelancer for the Daily Times. This is the kind of journalism that I do. I learned how to surf as a result of immersion journalism. I went to the newsroom and the editor said, hey, can you learn how to surf this summer? And I went, okay. And I wrote about it all summer and now I'm obsessed with it. So basically immersion journalism is an acknowledgement and uh, that the reporter is a part of the story. And there's several uh, areas on the spectrum that this story can fall anywhere from I'm a witness to the story. So basically anything, any type of reporting that takes place 
beyond a telephone call uh, where you're actually there in person. I'm a member of the community. So this might be somebody speaking to a community that they're a part of. Um, I'm a participant in the story. This is my favorite thing to do is to actually participate alongside of the sources, but still keep it as a third person type of story where I'm recording their experiences. And then finally, the first person I am the story, which is less common, but still an appreciated form uh, of storytelling. And basically, immersion journalism focuses on showing rather than telling. It draws on the reporter's own experiences, but the, the result is not usually about the reporter. It focuses on the larger world picture, the bigger picture. Um, you know, how does my experience fit into the experience that this group has? Now that I'm seeing it and experiencing it too, how can I write about it or produce a story about it that is more truthful uh, and, and more uh, uh, focused? So um, this is a quote from Ted Conover, who uh, wrote, literally wrote the book on immersion journalism. Uh, and he says, it's work that grows out of a writer's efforts to learn about somebody else's world by placing himself in it for a while. And Ted is one of those guys, uh, he's, I got to interview him. I've interviewed him several times. He's actually spoken to my classes uh, on FaceTime and I interviewed him for the book. Uh, and he's, he has written dozens of books. He's crossed the border with Mexican immigrants um, he's uh, gone train hopping with um, homeless hobos uh, across the country. He has uh, worked in Sing Sing uh, as a prison guard and written about all these experiences uh, as a reporter. So really, really cool. And what this does, what um, uh, immersion does, is that it enhances our transparency and credibility. It shows the reader the process of your story and allows uh, people to understand how you reported it. And that builds trust and credibility in a time uh, that, that the news media's credibility, frankly, is, is very low. It's Most people would say that they don't trust the media. They do, in fact, they just say they don't. Um, but our, our, our trust uh, factor has gone way down in, year, in recent years. The next chapter is about community journalism. And this is where I was able to actually pull a lot of stuff that I uh, learned here at SU about civic engagement into my classrooms. And so I've actually taught community journalism as both an honors class uh, and a, a senior seminar here at SU. Uh, and there's basically three types. There's community, uh, geographic communities, those that focus you know, on hyper-local content, uh, niche communities, so communities of shared experience or interest, uh, and then my favorite engagement strategies. So the one that I talk about and focus on in my classes the most often is what's called the Harkin Method. Um, and this is a company aimed at uh, involving the community in the reporting process, putting the community's needs first. Instead of saying to you, hey, we know what stories you care about, it's actually putting the reporters in the community and asking people, hey, what do you want to know? about your community and kind of reverse engineering those stories. And so I've had students do these projects and the, the work that they've uncovered uh, is really phenomenal. In fact, uh, we have a stand pipe here in Salisbury and uh, this group of students set up uh, a table at the dog park and uh, gave dogs treats and asked people, what do you wanna know about Salisbury? And one person said she had heard a rumor that people used to, in the, in the early 1900s, used to throw unwanted babies in the standpipe at Salisbury. And I was, and he was like, I don't think I'm going to report that though. And I was like, uh, you have to report that. I am desperate to know what this is about. And it turns out that no, it's not true, but it's based on a true story of a kid that did fall into the standpipe uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, and, and he was able to really tell that story about where this rumor came from and this fascinating history uh, of this uh, basically monumental uh, structure in Salisbury. And the greatest part about the Harkin strategy is that it includes underserved communities. So this was actually born out of Chicago, um, where a lot of the reporting is done on the elite, uh, very high end downtown side. Uh, and so what they did as reporters there with um, the Chicago uh, public radio station is they set up uh, areas in underserved communities, uh, less affluent communities, and started focusing stories on their needs. Uh, and it was really a great project. Um, digging deeper with reporting uh, on solutions journalism, this is actually a class, again, I've taught as an honors class, and I'm currently teaching as a senior seminar, so a few of my students who are in this class right now are learning this method. Uh, and solutions journalism, uh, I was able to attend an actual workshop in Oregon where this movement was born, uh, which proposes a shift away from problem-oriented journalism uh, to more solutions-based. So instead of just focusing the story 
on what's wrong, uh, what the problem is. Instead, it focuses the story on people and organizations who are working to solve it. So this isn't fluffy, you know, storytelling. It's actually more rigorous investigative journalism because it dives in deeper to really go beyond just the here's what's wrong. And it answers some of those questions. So uh, the attributes of a solution story are a response to the problem, evidence of results. So you can't just say, oh, well, it's a good idea, right? We have to actually have evidence included in the story. Insight, so context into, uh, into the response so that others could replicate it. And then, of course, no good investigative story is complete without listing the limitations of success. Not, uh, there's not a solution out there that works for everybody every time. And so we have to, as journalists, acknowledge uh, that our, our work, uh, that the work that we're reporting on does have limitations, and we need to make sure and incorporate those into the story. Um, finally, the last three chapters are about uh, more of the multimedia reporting angle. So photojournalism, audio and video, and then new tools. Uh, and the reason why I incorporated these into a book that's largely meant for writers is because there's no such thing as just a writer anymore. When you walk into a newsroom, any newsroom, they're going to hand you this, and they're going to expect you to be out there taking videos, photos, audio clips, all kinds of stuff, not just writing. Um, so the, the chapter emphasizes different mobile devices for ways that you can uh, tell stories using photo essays, vignettes, podcasts, audio clips, and different video strategies. Um, but the exciting chapter, I think, is the last chapter on new tools, which talks about, and this is where um, future editions of the book will really have to um, keep up, because uh, it talks about emerging apps uh, and new perspectives with technology. So action cameras, drones, augmented and virtual reality, and even robot reporting. Um, robots are taking over, really, the newsroom. Uh, in fact, most uh, Associated Press game uh, stories, a lot like uh, game stories and stock market stories, are actually produced by robots because they are that formulaic. So um, the extra features in the book that I'm really happy about uh, include helpful hints boxes in every chapter. So things like this, I actually was just using this graphic today in my uh, mobile journalism class. Um, so every chapter has its own helpful hints kind of breakout box. Also, it has features from the field, which are usually kind of journalistic uh, pieces uh, from people who are using the equipment or the reporting strategies. This, uh, some of you guys, I know you know Brooke, um, she's an actual graduate from our department and uh, was in six of my classes and we're still in, in close touch. And Brooke is now a reporter over in um, uh, Nashville and she is a trained drone pilot. Uh, and so I interviewed her and included uh, her story in my chapter on new tools. And then Words with Prose are interviews with uh, journalists and educators and experts in the field uh, who could kind of give an overview about the concept. So this one is Steve Hartman. He's a really popular correspondent for CBS News. Uh, and he does um, the kind of uh, community journalism that really only a dedicated feature storyteller could do. So that we had a, we had a great chat uh, and, and his story is in there too. Also in most chapters, there's this feature called the whole story in which I take an actual story uh, and I kind of annotate it, break out, okay, here's what they're doing here. Here's what this piece is. So really it's an instructional tool to help uh, you know, students learn uh, the nuts and bolts to be able to really break down a story and tell it in a lot of different ways. And then finally, each ch chapter has different graphics and images to help kind of visualize uh, and, and put help, help you put things in context there. So that's the book. And if you like it and, uh, or you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to follow uh, my page on Facebook. Uh, I have an author page at Jennifer Brannett Cox uh, on Facebook. So I hope that you'll follow it. And I do try to post um, different articles uh, and commentary about things that are going on in the field, digital age, uh, journalism, uh, and feature reporting strategies. So uh, I hope that you'll, you'll go on and like me and, uh, and maybe even comment. And I'd be happy to interact with you there just like a real reporter does. Uh, and that's, that's it for me. So thank you guys uh, for your attention. Thank you so much. And we have time for a question or a comment. And maybe Dr. Cox, when you get a moment, you could put your link in the chat. Here. So here's your opportunity to ask a question, share a thought before we transition to our other author. Well, don't all ask it once now. No. I have a question, Dr. Cox. 
Yeah, go ahead, Gary. Um, you were talking about the uh, solutions journalism. That sounded really interesting to me. I was just wondering if you could give me an example of that or if it had something specific to do with the Oregon area since, as I'm sure I've told you about a bazillion times, I lived there for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, so Oregon is actually just where it was founded um, at the University of Oregon and uh, the Portland paper there uh, was largely responsible for kind of the movement, but um, it's not specifically tied to Oregon anymore. In fact, there's something called the Solutions Journalism News Network, and I'd be happy to share the link to you. And it, it chronicles uh, stories all over the world of journalists who are adopting this strategy. And basically all it is, is it's, it's a different kind of storytelling. So um, say for instance, there's a, a mass shooting, right? Every news outlet in the country is gonna go out and report on the, the breaking news of the mass shooting, you know, your who, what, when, where. But then what a solutions journalist is gonna do is after that has settled, we're gonna look into the why and the how, and we're gonna look for organizations who are aiming to respond in some way to that, to offer solutions. So instead of focusing on the problem of a mass shooting, focusing on organizations that are maybe lobbying for gun control or organizations that are helping people recover from mental health issues as a result. And again, breaking down the story into here's what the response is and the steps that are taken. Here's some insight, some background into the how and why. Um, here's some evidence that it's working. So actual quantifiable and, qu and uh, qualifiable data and then and limitations. Why doesn't this work for everyone everywhere um, or what are some of, how far can it go? Um, so those are the kind of stories that they do. And I'll share um, the Solutions Journalism News Network in the, in the chat for you. Um, and it's something I look forward to continuing to teach. Like I said, I'm teaching it right now uh, in my uh, senior seminar class uh, and, and the students are getting a taste for it there. And I also teach it obviously in this class, Advanced Feature Storytelling. Thank you. And again, if you want to put any of those links in the chat, that is fantastic. I did put the Facebook link. Yeah, I saw that. Thank you. Jamal, you're unmuted. Did you have a question? Yes, I did. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cox, this is kind of a general question, but what made you want to get into education? That's a great question, Jamal. Um, so I was, as you know, a working journalist uh, for my career. Uh, and I knew that I wanted to, my, my original plan was to start, it to, was to use tr uh, journalism to transition into public relations um, because a lot of great public relations practitioners start in the journalism field. Um, but then I just, I was in love with journalism. I love every bit of it. I love the dialogue. I love the uh, experience of doing it. I can never imagine a job again in my life where I have to sit behind a desk and do the same thing every day, all day long. Uh, and teaching is very much part of that. I mean, teaching at a university like Salisbury allows me to create all these different courses to write books like these, uh, to work with fine students like yourself. Uh, and so I still get to basically act as a journalist um, because I do still do some of that. Um, but I also get to stay up to date on the field and watch you guys experience what I did uh, as a working journalist. And I just love that. Thank you. And again, we'll have more time for questions for Dr. Cox, but we appreciate you especially inviting your students and your mother. That was fantastic. <laughs> so we're going to transition to our second author, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Vanita Argawal, whose research theorizes ecologically aware, relational, and dialogic understanding of whole person care and health promotions, disease prevention, and chronic illness management. Her research has been published in journals such as Health Communication, the Journal of Patient Experience, Qualitative Health Research, Journal of Advanced Nursing, and the Journal of American College Health. She's an associate editor at Frontiers in Communication and has received top paper recognition from the Applied Communication Division of the National Communication Association. Her monograph, Medical Humanism, Chronic Illness, and the Body in Pain and Ecological Wholeness, integrates her meditation practice, native knowledge, and professional training in Vipassana meditation and Ayurvedic diet and wellness. Even as life expectancies increase, growing number of people are living with chronic illness and pain. Long-term self-management of chronic conditions 
involve negotiating the intersections of personal life choices, community and workplace structures, and family roles. This book proposes an ecological model of wholeness. So thank you so much, Dr. Agarwal. Um, thank you for having me. And I'm really glad to be here and talk a little bit about the book. So I'm going to share my screen and try and pull up the PowerPoint. Um, just a note ahead that I'm going to have a little bit of a thought exercise going on in here. So if you have a pen and paper handy, that might help. Um, okay, give me a second. Okay, so this presentation is an exploration of what it means to be whole. And by whole, I mean not simply healthy, not how to heal, not how to practice self-care, or how to recover from illness that has taken a hold in our bodies. It's an inquiry into what is lost when we focus on just being healthy, or on preventing disease, or on recovery from pain. While all these are important, the book argues, they are mechanisms en route to fully being who we are. Our sense of purpose, our ability to harmonize and reconcile disruptions, and our ability to sustain fulfillment in alignment with our environment. Having said that, the book itself centers its attention on those who are managing chronic pain and describes practices for living with chronic pain in fulfilling ways. It looks at how relationships and our healthful practices, whether these be playing sports, music, practicing yoga, hiking, meditating, or going for long runs can reshape our relationship with ourselves, our bodies, and our environment. It draws upon my work with those living with chronic pain and illness, and those helping them address it through complementary and alternative medicine practices. I'm grateful to all those who have been a part of this journey through the years it has been in the making. What does it mean to be whole? To be whole is to be aware, open, and integrated in our relationship with the self and others with diverse human cultures and plant and animal species, and with the geological ecosystems that construct our planet. In this vast conceptual landscape, wholeness is achieved through openness to revising definitions of humanism, to rethinking how we position the self with the body, and to recognizing alternative ways of organizing knowledge, human experience, and relationships. Living with chronic illness is disruptive to one's sense of self one's relationship with others, and one's ability to participate in the lived environment. Those with chronic illness often seek to manage their care through the support of therapeutic providers, and often find practices like massage or chiropractic or acupuncture helpful. For each of us, those who are healthy, those whose bodies are in transition or recovery, or those managing illness, our efforts to maintain well-being are part of the same journey. In our time today, I'll present an ecological model of wholeness, where the individual, the ecosocial environment, the principles of nature as experienced through time and evolution, and culturally based health, traditional health practices come together in a dialogic framework. Central to wholeness is a recognition of the self. An informed awareness of the self or who we are is a cornerstone of the concept of self-reflexivity. The premise of self-reflexivity drawn from the symbolic inf interactionism perspective states, we come to know who and what we are through interaction with others. Reflexivity asks one to understand that meaning does not reside in an objectively defined world and is made through social and experiential understandings in the context of time, culture, and values. Being self-reflexive is to cultivate an awareness of one's identity through reflection. Self-reflexivity employs the interaction of language, perception, and meaning-making in continually constructing an awareness of ourself in daily life. It is based on the assumption that the individual and the world are engaged in a co-constitutive relationship. Today afternoon, I'd like to take us on a contemplative journey of imagination, reflection, and intention. So if you have a sheet of paper and pen, please take it out. And we'll also use the chat box if you want. A little jotting space for about 10 words is all we'll need today. So to begin, imagine the innermost you. What comes to mind, shape, color, attribute? Write it at the bottom of your paper, right? I write at the bottom and don't take more than two seconds to do that. Um, you can share it in the chat box if you like. Now it doesn't have to make sense. Just put down what is your most spontaneous response. 
So what, when you think about you, what's the word that comes to mind? In practice, the notion of self-reflexive awareness can be understood as giving full attention to a physiological or cognitive experience. Experiences such as disease, illness, and healing benefit from cultivating self-reflexivity in the monitoring of body sensations, reactions, and the non-verbal meaning making hidden in physiological perceptions. So the language of the body can be used as a means of communication to be aware of the self. <clears throat> The experiential sense of who we are is anchored in the body. The monitoring exercise that you just did suggested that in the cultivation of self-reflexivity reflects the ways the body inscribes our experiences and knowledges. Embodiment is defined as a representation or expression of an idea or quality through the body. As world notes, we both have and are the body. The embodied self experiences healing as a connection of intentionality with its authentic expression through the body. Here, healing is the sense of wholeness that is felt when the self, the body, and the environment are working in alignment with each other. This sense of wholeness is disrupted in the chronic pain experience when our sense of self seems disconnected from the body. In cultivating an embodied subjectivity, imagination, imagination is related in meaningful ways with representation of bodily objects and sensations to evoke intentionality. This form of intentional meaning making relates the internal to the external and the subjective experience with the objective experience. So now in an earlier slide, you had imagined the self and you had written one word right at the bottom of that page or, and in the chat box, I hope you wrote, I can't see the chat box while I'm here on this page. Now imagine the body that yourself has not in terms of shape and looks, but how it feels. So that's really important. Just try and think of what that body feels like. Can you just write on one word that describes how it feels? And please write it in the chat box too, if you like. It could be hot, cold, anything that spontaneously comes to mind. If you're comfortable, do share it in the ch chat box. What practices enable us to cultivate the embodied sense of self in an intentional manner? I argue that by re-examining the humanities and their relationship with human purpose, we can understand their intimate relationship with our health and well-being beyond a sense of human purpose and fulfillment. For example, art offers the potential of exploring experiences that are symbolically represented in and by the body, such as freedom, power, and imagination. By representing the human body as an aesthetic form, healing can be imagined in an exploration of freedom of potentiality and the exercise of constructing it through the hands of the individual themselves. Likewise, community rituals and belonging offer ways of attributing relational significance to individual actions of health responsibility. In very practical terms, these might look like vaccination decisions. Recognizing the body through a relational framework emphasizes how vulnerability and change intersect with everyday experiences to support well-being. Taking the body self axis as the subject, so we just thought about the self, and now we're talking about the body. I argue that, uh, that individual experiences and their construction of the chronic pain experience can be reshaped towards productive outcomes. So we look at the dis discursive body now. Intersubjective awareness or awareness of another subjectivity in a co-constituted space offers acceptance of body conditions and the ability to change. Being open to a discursive construction of the body is closely connected with the idea of being vulnerable to change as a choice. The vulnerable self includes the possibility of the self that is open to change through choice and agency. Imagine the body that the innermost you has, not in terms of how it feels, but how you might describe it now. So in the first one, you looked at it in terms of how it felt, now I'm asking you to describe it. So if you were to describe your body, not the feeling of the body, but how would you describe it now? What, would you, how, what is one word that would describe what your body is like? You could write it in the chat box or on that page. That chat box would be helpful if everyone would like to share it over there, that's nice. Um, fully embodying the idea of the ethic of vulnerability as an open, self empowers the individual to examine the discursive body, subjective change and healing to transform chronic brain and the illness bodily experiences. 
Practices such as journaling as a narrative exploration provide the support of guiding individuals to being intentionally vulnerable to a multiplicity of discursive interpretations. The material physical body the, is arguably the earliest site of our experiences. It is the site of inscription of our lived knowledges, meaning making and relationships. I now consider the material body through its communicative representations constructs risk, disease conditions, and its changing physiological composition. The healthy body, the body in transition, and the diseased body are the stages of the body reflecting the public health categories of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Each is characterized with its own unique vulnerabilities and avenues for health promotion, disease prevention, biological, biomedical intervention, and clinical treatment. When we are faced with a deteriorating body or a body in pain, disruption or disease, we are forced to listen to our body's often strange voice, speaking with us all the time, interrupting what we're doing and forcing us to revise our well thought out life plans. So let's think about our material physical body for a moment. Think about how it looks like in a mirror. What does it look like uh, when you look at yourself in the mirror? Um, write it on top of your last word and share it in the chat box too, if you can. How do we cultivate a material body that is in alignment with our inner self and the embodied self and the discursive body, especially when the material body is going its own way during times of disease, speaking a strange language of pain and illness through its myriad de debilitating symptoms. Research has shown how mind-body practices such as dance allow individuals to express themselves and communicate empathy. Notably, these studies show that they do so while relating the intersectionality of the material body with the embodied self. Once we have examined the alignment of our inner self and the body, we can examine our relationship with the context. So we are ourself and the body, and now I'm looking at the context here. The ecological model of wholeness looks at the context through the layers of time, change and illness intrusion, traditional health practices, and food, nature, and our eco-social planetary body. First, in order to understand our relationship with time with healing, we delve into how time and its related attribute of change affects our perception of who we are. A significant amount of research has examined how self-concept in its relationship with illness identity and illness intrusion can help us explain how people perceive and live with illness and disease. Self-concept theory explains how the sense of self is continuously affected by one's experiences in different ways under varying conditions. I examine how self-concept in relationship with the notion of subjective time can help us understand the body self-disruption brought about by those living with chronic illnesses and involved in management of their long-term challenges. Chronic illnesses provide an illustrative case for understanding the adaptive challenges that disrupt the individual's sense of self and self-narratives in debilitating ways. So you had the axis of body and self. In the top left corner now, you have the, the focus on movement and stillness, which comes through time. So write down one thing that has changed in your body one, and one thing that has remained the same since you were born. Okay, and hopefully if you like, you would also share it in, this, in the chat box. I'm not giving it too much time, so I'm hoping you do be very spontaneous about this if you're, if you're doing this exercise. Although the very individual and unique nature of living with chronic conditions challenges the individual to see themselves beyond being a body in pain. By connecting the body self access with the contextual layers of the environment, individuals can shift the perception of pain and its relationship with time. So Buber's notion of the I and thou, me and you, illustrates how music and mind body practices like yoga, for instance, in their contemplative function can cultivate stability in the present. Those living with chronic conditions and their comorbidities are often challenged to anchor themselves in the present and to be open to their environment. In these practices, we acknowledge that anchoring the chronic illness experience in the changing present is a continual act of embodying change in the body. So position within time, the next layer teases apart the meanings of silence, solitude, and available presence. 
I assert that the work of healing is intimately associated with the ability to be internally quiet, still, and contemplative in dynamic and active engagement with our context. As elemental and primal that a state of solitude may seem, it is anything but. Undertaken with guidance and training, solitude provides us with a way to connect with and sustain a sense of wholeness. However, if not practiced carefully, silence and solitude can be very punitive, disruptive, and harmful. And so you have to be practicing it under a careful, guided manner. Intentional communicative and body self-silence cultivated with the goal of creating an open discursive space of relationality provides a mechanism for creating agency and illuminating spaces of personal expansion without the use of words. Such silence can enable individuals to reintegrate the body in pain and situate themselves in their lives in a productive manner. So look at the top right corner and look at the body again. This time, close your eyes and hear your body. How does your body sound? If you had to put a sound like word for it, what would it look like? And jot it down on the paper if you can. So silence is one of the earliest pre-cultural phenomena that guides how we as individuals perceive and make sense of another's intentions, words, and actions. Intentionally cultivated silence is a powerful and important means of focusing dialogic engagement with another in deliberate ways. In a final look at context, I look at food, nature, and the environment. Food sustains life. While we are aware of the global challenge to the universal availability of food or access to food, we remain oblivious to the fundamental taken for great granted premise of our right to food. We don't question that. Beyond the constraints of food access, availability, and affordability, we don't question our position with food in or as compromising our body self in a communicative and dialogic manner. So let's examine the assumption and relationships embedded in our practices of production and consumption of food. Our relationship with food in contemporary times is shaped by mediated and social influences. These influences range from sociocultural disruptions, representations, and concern with appearances that warp our primal relationship with food. It is these maladjustments that are manifest, for instance, in nutrition and metabolic disorders, and a host of chronic conditions, including obesity and the comorbid stressors underlying cancers that disrupt our body-self relationship. So I, I examine the assumptions that are embedded in these practices of production and consumption of food. Think about the last food item you consumed. What, what was it? Was it a snack before you came here for this talk? Is it something you're eating right now? Were you hungry when you consumed it? Where did it come from? What were its qualities? So look at the bottom right side of the box of the slide here. And imagine that part of food as, as now being a part of you. Which of those qualities do you see in yourself from that food? Can you take a moment, this one, take a little moment and write it down thinking back to the last piece of food you ate. And it's not a, you don't have to think too much. So just a quick jotting in a few seconds is all it requires. Approaching our individual relationship with food invokes the need to take a deeper look at how we understand food and its role on our lives on the one hand, and how we make meaning of health, healing, and wholeness on the other. From a critical perspective, Shiva extends the knowledge of food as a relationship argument to the evocative question of our responsibility to other species. She asks, do the boundaries between species have integrity or are these boundaries mere constructs that should be broken for human convenience? Her call to transgress boundaries questions the assumptions of who is being protected by what actions and how these affect the freedom of those connected in this cycle. The basic argument is that we are all in this planet connected and in some ways we make each other. The sustainability argument put forward by Eden advocates thinking beyond anthropocentric concerns in sustainability to include the health and well being of other creatures, recognizing that we are all related. These anthropomorphic arguments center food with the health of, health of all. In food, we find health of all is the central idea here in both psychological and physical ways to propose an interconnected approach for all elements as one organism. 
So by now you should uh, hopefully have had a, a page full of uh, written words. Uh, but before I move to that, I'd like to offer my thanks to all the institutional support that I've received for doing this book and uh, without which it would have not been possible. So uh, let me stop share. And <laughs> I do see some of you wrote in the chat. I wasn't sure because I couldn't see. Now this exercise, if we went through it a little bit more carefully for each of your pages, would have been something where I would, uh, where you would take a look at every one of our pages and design your own ways of reconnecting back to yourself and in, uh, put yourself in alignment with the environment based on some of the practices we saw. So all of these practices can be individually tailored to what we eat, who we think we are, what kind of pain and disease conditions we're going through and how we can adjust to the environment. That's for another day, but I'm glad for your presence here and for all of you for following along and being patient with this exercise. And thank you for contributing. Thank you so much. So I don't know if you could see the icons, you got lots of hand claps and you will definitely have a wealth of material in the chat when you get a second to read. And Andy. So Again, this is your excellent opportunity to ask some questions or maybe you want to comment on that exercise. So feel free to unmute. Yeah, I definitely think um, as far as the food thing goes, it's kind of relevant because like I noticed like when I eat, health, when I eat a little healthier, I feel less groggy and like more of myself a little bit like yeah, right. so that's very that's very perceptive. I think uh, at the very it's very important to just be aware that how whatever we eat shapes how we think and how we feel because it goes really deep in that connection. I agree with what Ben said, and um, I know we talked about it a lot last semester in in uh, three forty one, but. Um, yeah, like if I, you know, if I eat a really greasy breakfast, for example, I feel, I feel pretty disgusting for the rest of the day. And I don't really want to, <clears throat> I don't really want to get moving and I don't even want to activate my brain like I should be. So, yeah. That's true. And thanks, Patrick, for sharing that, because I think uh, if you think a little deeper and so you go beyond going just groggy, which is really just the first step and such an important step to thinking about how it connects with where your food came from and where it got made and the soil and how it all comes together to who you are. Those practices can really help you come in, you know, sort of become a little bit more aware of what you're picking up from the grocery aisle. And maybe seeing like what kind of chemicals went in it, where was it, all kinds of things can play into that. So you, there's, there's a lot you can get digging into beyond the greasy package. That doesn't stop me from picking up my flaming hot Cheetos though. <laughs> I definitely, what the other, uh, what uh, Ben and Patrick said was true, but it's, it's kind of tricky for me because I need to take Adderall to think and I, can't eat when I'm on Adderall. So I often find that when I'm thinking my best or I'm doing my most schoolwork is when I haven't eaten for say 72 hours or so it, it's kind of hard to balance that out for me. Like I, I can either eat or I can be productive, but I can't really do both. That sounds very nice for all of us who would snack while doing work and wish we weren't compulsively just snacking. <laughs> but, oh, I'm um... still overweight, but... Uh... <laughs> Well, but Rylan, I think uh, if I can call you Rylan, uh, your point is well taken. And uh, sometimes actually, because this is going towards how you would manage conditions. So being aware of how those conditions affect your appetite and how, how it affects your well-being as well, is, is, it's, a great, it's a great step to start. And so you can manage those conditions in a more um, whole person centered way alongside your medications. And this is our opportunity to keep asking questions. And again, if we want to draw any connections between the two topics, I see you, Gia, has unmuted. So I'll stop there. But again, we're, we're open to questions and comments for either author. Oh, Dr. thanks, Chris. <laughs> that, um, I, um, I came late to the party. I apologize for that. I, everything was delayed and I just had my lunch. Um, but uh, 
I, I guess I just have some thoughts about connections um, of just um, things I saw from the slides and I heard from um, Benita's presentation on food. Um, so, well, not just because I'm a foodie, <laughs> food is always on my mind, but uh, there are two kinds of connections that um, I thought of. One is, um, interestingly, over the summer, I went to a conference on aesthetics, so philosophy of art and beauty, that sort of thing. And, um, but uh, there was one philosopher who said, look, um, we talk about taste. It, right, it's, uh, it, it's both referring to taste in, as in the, in the sense of beauty, right? Taste in things and also taste as, well, when we taste food, that kind of tastes like a, a sensory kind of thing. And he says, he draws the analogy. He says, in the case of eating, right? That kind of taste, um, it's a social practice. The ways humans eat are very, very different from the ways animals eat. And exactly like what Vinita, you said, it's uh, very much about, uh, you have to think about the entire sort of process, how food gets produced, how it's harvested, how we eat it, and, and what kinds of food we select, and all of these choices, very, very human, and uh, a lot of them cerebral, <laughs> uh, sometimes aesthetic, and ultimately very fundamentally social. And, and so I thought, wow, that's, I, right, that's a kind of connection I saw. And the other one, also, I, um, I made some friends um, who are sort of farmers or experts in agriculture and, and they work in sustainable um, agricultural farming practices. And yeah, so all the stuff you said about, we need to think back to where your food came from and food security, all of that really relates and resonates with what I've been thinking about. And yeah, thank you. Those are excellent comments. I just, I'll just tease out one comment from there that taste taste as an aesthetic and you're consuming food, but you're also consuming, you're tasting a lot of things. You taste, uh, you know, various kinds of feelings as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a mode of consumption. And so we, we can broaden who we are by really expanding our senses in meaningful ways. That's, a, that's just a tiny, tiny thing I got from your comment. Um, I think also as far as Dr. Cox's textbook goes, um, I think students probably will be, will be able to use it like in the future if they decide to go into journalism for careers, they can use it like as a reference and stuff. So um, because of all the like the modern updates about like apps and stuff like that. So yeah. Thanks, Ben. That was actually one of my, uh, what one of my goals was to uh, make it something that could be a resource in newsrooms because um, basically from chapters five onward, uh, they're all new concepts, uh, particularly the three reporting chapters in the middle might be techniques or styles that practicing journalists have never heard of. Uh, unfortunately, like with most fields in journalism, the educators at the college level are the first to learn about these. Uh, and it doesn't always trickle into the newsrooms until our students graduate and start to make changes and get into leadership positions in the newsroom. So there's a real delay. Uh, between new concepts being introduced in colleges and then being introduced in newsrooms. So it's my hope that some newsrooms will adopt this. Dr. Cox, I already asked my mom to order it for me. Hey, all right. <laughs> Dr. Cox, have you been able to do lectures or workshops with professional journalists? Uh, not yet. Um, we were. I was supposed to. Um, when this came out, be it was right around the time of AEJMC, our big, our big uh, educators conference, uh, journalism educators conference, and SPJ's national conference. But because of COVID, all of that was moved to virtual. So unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to really do any kind of publicity. But I see your point that it would be hugely valuable to close that perhaps generational gap and you know, experience technological gap between reports. Yeah. In particular, solutions is this emerging uh, phase of, of reporting that just, if you bring it, I tell my students, I'm like, you guys have an opportunity to literally walk into a newsroom and know more about what's happening right now in the, in the industry and new strategies than the editors who are interviewing you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Benita, I was curious about the medical humanism part of your book and the project overall, just the sort of what the term um, means in the um, context from which you're um, thinking here. So that's a, that's a very interesting question because that literally grounds the whole approach here. Um, it's medical humanism because I'm grounding it in the context of chronic illness and pain management. So very much looking at how people who are um, dealing with these long-term conditions and the providers who help them deal with it, most some of them are here and I'm very grateful for them being here, um, uh, relate with their patients and help them actually achieve a certain kind of fulfilling life and positive outcomes. Um, in terms of like looking at how they use uh, their practice as medicine, um, while also connecting aspects of art and the humanities and philosophy, and especially thinking through things like the I, thou, those kind of relationships with Buber's work and many other kind of like phenomenological ways of looking at things where you're experiencing in certain ways and your provider is sharing their experience with you. So there was a Christian massage therapist here who I had spoken with, and she talked about so much of her work being really involved with the centrality of how she talked about it, how her presence helped her patients, and how that really helped them get more comfort in their lives that got them coming back with respect to dealing with their pain and other situations. So my goal was to see how so many of us who are managing different kinds of conditions can employ these kind of constructs that people draw from um, their, their religion, maybe their understandings of their philosophy or their understandings of self and what they bring to that context, help people, help others uh, feel better in a very simple way. So uh, when I say feel better, I mean, achieve different kinds of healthful outcomes in their uh, management of conditions. Also important is that so many conditions that we look at like chronic in chronic illness domain are those that are lifelong and they're not uh, they're being managed. They're somewhere in some way or another. We're all managing them. So how we can manage them through a shift of our own narratives. So the humanism part comes in there. Uh, how do we look at our own construction of ourselves and and relate it to our uh, to how we are feeling, uh, how, how 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 we define health and healing. So uh, that's a very short answer to that very long book you might have to read it i guess so because medical humanism really goes towards in my book it goes towards that aspect mm. but thank you for asking do you want to mention the health humanities minor usia is here yeah. and this yeah. book has been this actually has been it has i i oh let me at least say a word of gratitude so uh there is so much of work that i did two people actually are here from the health humanities yeah. minor both of them being very foundational to the work so i'm grateful for tina for being here yushia is here as well <laughs> so um uh so this book also EJ forms a part of my yeah and EJ. oh ej too where is yeah of course so ej yushia and uh tina are all here um, and this, at that time, I was a part of that group, and we were really looking through and thinking through how we should integrate humanities and uh, Nitina being from nursing, so the, the medical side of things into developing a sort of a productive relationship with that. And so uh, I'll let uh, Yusha talk about the vision for the health humanities that came through, and uh, how, if you want to say a few words, Yusha, you don't have to. Uh... <laughs> I didn't expect that, but um, uh, thanks, Chris, for bringing it up. So the, um, well, it's a new minor that uh, we were able to, uh, as a FLC, we were able to put together and uh, we included um, courses from uh, humanities, uh, social sciences, and also from CHHS, I think, um, that focus on health and medicine, but more from uh, looking at the social, ethical, philosophical, those kinds of aspects um, of health and medicine. So the, the, I think a lot of the things Benita was talking about, um, right, that is looking at health and medicine, um, not so much from a technical, you can say, uh, kind of perspective, but more from well, we are humans, right? How do we relate and, and how do we think about ourselves? Um, those kinds of questions, uh, those kinds of perspectives. So, and global, <laughs> yes, and cultural, right? Global perspective that Tina said in the, in the chat, yeah. 
Um, so we are a um, pretty, yeah, pretty young, pretty new uh, minor, and uh, we're trying to spread the message, trying to connect with faculty from different uh, departments and schools. And so if anyone, I don't know, um, you, you know about any course that maybe should be part of the minor, um, then we, we'll be very happy to uh, consider that and try to expand it really, yeah. Thank you. I would just jump in there to, to say that I'm, I'm very excited about the minor and, and kind of the potential that it has and kind of connecting it back to what what uh, Dr. Agarwal was talking about earlier and saying that I personally struggled with finding those words, um, but it's got the wheels turning here and I'm thinking a lot about ways sort of metaphors maybe even that we have for um, how we how we function and I sort of come on music in some ways thinking about rhythm right rhythms in our lives um, and how we try to achieve rhythms and sort of steady rhythms the fact that I didn't have a very good lunch today and now feel tired realizing that those those regular infusions of nourishment are really important for our bodies to sort of to support our bodies and have them do what they're supposed to do. Rest is really important with that. Um, but even sort of meditation, quiet, uh, sort of the playing off loud passages with, um, with quieter passages. Um, and then to what Yuju was just saying, talk, Jen's really interested in ethics. And I think that's a real important point of connection. And the opportunity with this minor to sort of come around here to give, to give students the opportunity to kind of curate uh, their experience as students, right? Not just be sort of ticking off boxes, but to say, I'm, I'm, my major is in a, is in a healthcare field, but here's an opportunity for me to put together courses in communication and, and philosophy and, and other areas that allow me to kind of harmonize, harmonize my undergraduate experience in a way that kind of makes sense and is, is more powerful than the sum of its parts. I'll stop. No, it's perfect. And you may want to lead us to the conclusion. So I'm thinking about how you started the conversation that we have two books from communication that are very different, that really illustrate, I think, the diversity and the breadth of the field and sometimes the misunderstanding of the field. And so Martin, if you want to close us out, I think that would be great. I, I, Can I just Jen, yes. <laughs> Uh, additionally, just don't want to give a little plug for the multimedia journalism minor that is oh, yeah. also new. Um, yeah. It's been around uh, now about a year and a half, and it uh, includes a lot of the stuff um, that you could get from communication, but focuses you on the on the MMJ track. So, and I'm I'm just reading what you just put in the chat. Yeah, and you, do you want to unmute and share that with us? I'm looking for the multimedia journalism link. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, no, no, you didn't. But, Not at um, all. Save well, the bell. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, wow. So this is actually um, a proposal that was submitted to the Fulton Public Humanities Committee. And we are going to, uh, the FLC, the Health Humanities FLC is going to sponsor the event. Um, and it's called the One Woman Show, where um, as you can see in the description, um, I think it's an artist or a storyteller, Beth um, Olsen. Uh, she's going to portray this uh, first woman to receive a medical degree in the U.S. and uh, tell her story. And so I thought it would be inter interesting to anyone who is interested in you know, health humanities, medicine, women's history, those kinds of issues. And so I didn't say the date. It's it's sort of still, we're trying to figure out the best date, but it should be towards the end of this month um, as part of the Women's History Month um, events. So, uh, and, and it will be advertised. And so hopefully we, we get a good audience turnout. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We're happy to help promote it. And I, I put the multimedia journalism in the chat too, as well as links to the book, both the books. I'm sorry if you're interested. I assume we're still still virtual with many of those events, and but that kind of triggers another thought that um, when we're not in a pandemic, thinking about how moving our bodies from one place to another is is really 
I, I've reflected on that certainly. Um, the, the importance of that in in the course of a day, having time between meetings to be by yourself, even walking from one place to another, sort of uh, sort of closing off what you've just done, getting ready for the next thing, and your body moving through space, just being a really important part of your daily life is something that we very much miss right now where transitions between meetings mean you hit the leave button and then you find how am I going to get into the next meeting <laughs> and it's always a little bit different uh, which is sort of really I think weighs on our minds and our brains in a way that um, our normal lives and the and the value of physically moving from one space to another something we never really thought about before I never thought about before I'll just say that That's very true, Martin, and that's a very that's a very thoughtful comment to leave for us in a way that uh, that connects both. I think what you're saying here is silence and movement and space and technology and Zoom and what it means to stare at everyone here on the screen, visibly being in a room and feeling the presence of everyone in a in a very distinctive way. And the final thing I just put in the chat is the Eventbrite link if you want to register to join us for more Fulton Colloquia events, which I hope you do. And so our next one will be April 6th. It's kind of hard to believe the next time we gather will be April. And we also will have two book authors. One of them is with us right now, E.J. Hahn, and then Aston Gonzalez. And so they'll be looking at cultural narratives in, in their recent books. And so we, we hope you'll join us for that as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cox and Dr. Agarwal. Thank you all for being with us. Thanks everybody, see you next yeah. time. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Chris, yeah. thank you for moderating. Thank you, Mrs. Egan.